Good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Apologies have been received today from Claire Baker MSP and Stuart McMillan MSP and uh, Neil Finlay MSP is here as a substitute for Claire Baker. Uh, Neil, do you have any relevant interest you wish to declare? Okay, thank you very much. Our first item on the agenda today is an evidence session with the Ambassador of the Pub Republic of Austria to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, who currently holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union. I'd like to welcome the Ambassador, His Excellency Michael Zimmerman, and uh, invite the Ambassador to make an opening statement. <coughs> thank you very much, Madam Convener. Distinguished uh, members of the Scottish Parliament, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honour and pleasure for me here to be for the first time uh, in this magnificent building. I have been to Edinburgh many times before over the past decades, but it's uh, of course a very special moment to be in the Scottish Parliament and uh, to be able to, <clears throat> to meet such a distinguished uh, uh, committee here. Um, the Austrian uh, presidency comes at a spe very special um, moment in, 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 in for Austria. Uh, it is an 2018 is a year of uh, anniversaries. Anniversaries, good and bad. Uh, in 1848, uh, a revolution swept over Europe and uh, started uh, land reforms, legal reforms, constitutional reforms, and uh, opened uh, Europe to the societies that we have now. But at the same time, 1848 was also the beginning of uh, defined nationalism. In 1918, almost to the day, uh, today, uh, the Republic of Austria was uh, founded. Uh, the German-speaking remains of the Austro-Hungarian Austro monarchy. And I think the interesting uh, point uh, here in uh, the Scottish Parliament is that uh, the Republic of Austria was uh, founded by uh, the lender, the region, the regional states. It was not a top-down creation, but the lender came together on their own and uh, decided to set up the Republic uh, of Austria. And this uh, foundation on regional identity, on regional history, on regional culture is something that influences Austria until today. A darker moment came 80, 80 years ago, uh, again almost to the day, uh, in 1938, uh, after Austria was uh, annexed to the German uh, Reich, uh, unfortunately with the assistance of not a few Austrians. Uh, and the resulting uh, events and tragedies have uh, been a major factor in our, uh, <clears throat> in our uh, self uh, conscience until today. Uh, we are aware of the responsibilities, and uh, I think it's something that also influences our EU presidency. Um, 1948, and the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, uh, 1968, uh, revolution in Czechoslovakia, uh, 1998, then our first EU presidency, today we have our third one. Uh, and now 20 years after the first one, I am I'm very happy to be here and talk about the third Austrian EU presidency. In the, in the normal course of events, I would not be here because in the list of EU presidencies, the UK would have been slotted in in 2017. So we were quite relaxed about pre preparing our, our presidency, which was not due until next year. Uh, but then, of course, uh, after Brexit, it was decided that the UK should not take up its, its uh, scheduled uh, EU presidency, and the other countries moved forward by six months. So that's why I'm here today and uh, not next year's. Um, we are very aware, also because of the referendum in the UK, that um, somehow the, in many countries the link to the citizens uh, had, has been lost over the last years or maybe even 
decades, and uh, that uh, it is necessary to link with the people again, to listen to the people, and to put their concerns first. Um, in, in any EU presidency, the, the range of uh, issues that can be decided by the presidency itself is not very wide. Uh, most, of the, most of the topics and uh, projects have been going on for many years. We try to further them. We try to uh, conclude them. Uh, but there is a certain uh, leeway for bringing in your own priorities. And with regard of the concerns of the citizens, uh, we have made our first priority uh, a Europe that protects. Uh, the migration crisis in 2015 um, was a watershed in the history of the EU. Um, people uh, have lost their confidence in many places that the that they are states that the EU uh, is able and willing to protect them. And uh, we will try to, uh, we do try to uh, convince uh, the people that uh, the EU is willing and able to protect uh, the citizens. Um, within this motto, Europe that protects, we have uh, three uh, priority areas. One is the uh, fight against illegal migration. Second is um, protection of uh, prosperity and standard of living and competitiveness uh, through digitalization. And the third theme is, um, for us, uh, geographically logical, is the stability in the eastern part of Europe, especially in Southeast Europe and the Balkans. The European project is still unfinished. Uh, there are countries that uh, could rightly belong to the European Union, but for a number of reasons are not there yet, and we are uh, very much interested in, in helping them to join uh, the European Union and to extend the sphere of stability and prosperity uh, throughout Southeastern Europe as well. Uh, <clears throat> in, as far as migration is concerned, I think uh, one of the, uh, we have been talking for a long uh, time about the EU's external borders, uh, but in 2018 it was not, we were not able to protect or control these orders. It was on one hand was, it, was the sheer scale of the migration in 2015 that uh, uh, really uh, caused concern. On the other hand, it was the, the feeling that uh, the rule of law was lost. And uh, if a border uh, cannot uh, be protected, if citizens see that uh, uh, the authorities, be it the, the national or the European authorities, are not able to enforce the rule of law, then the loss of confidence uh, hurts everyone. So the fight against illegal migration, the future of the protection of the external borders, uh, and also the fight against uh, illegal activities in connection with, uh, with migration, especially uh, the uh, people smuggling uh, and, uh, and, and, and other um, organized uh, crime activities on the fringes and around illegal migration are, are one of our main uh, concerns. Uh, the future should see a strengthening of uh, Frontex, of the European agency that, that, that actually does uh, border control. It's, uh, of course, vastly understuffed uh, the, to protect uh, the, the sea, especially the sea borders in, South, in South, Southern Europe is, is a huge task, uh, but uh, we have to start and we have to get somewhere. Europe uh, will need to keep up uh, in the development of new technologies. I think the, the economic uh, uh, future of uh, the European Union will very much depend uh, on competitiveness uh, with regard, especially to, to Asian countries. Um, 
so we have to lay the basis uh, for a um, for an efficient use of technologies, but also I think we are very much aware of the of the pitfalls of new technologies, of the uh, problems they can create uh, for citizens uh, of uh, cyber crime, uh, of copyright, uh, uh, of uh, data protection, and uh, it's one of our aims to to find the right way uh, between the advan advancement advancement excuse me of technologies uh, and uh, the protection of citizens' uh, rights. Um, also, of course, the question that is also discussed in the EU the, is the, the ta taxation of the internet giants, and these are topics which will be very important for our citizens in the future. And we try to keep. Uh, to keep Europe at the forefront of competitiveness. Um, the level playing field in the uh, digital economy is uh, of great importance. Uh, Europe is characterized by small and medium enterprises, and we have to find ways to uh, preserve their competitiveness uh, faced uh, uh, with uh, international uh, giants. Uh, for the stability of our uh, neighborhood, uh, we must be aware that uh, tensions are never far away. Um, there has been progress made over the, over the past 20 years after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, but uh, not enough progress. Uh, there are still underlying uh, animosities. There is a, a lack of uh, economic and civic progress because of uh, ethnic and political differences. And uh, we will continue to work uh, hard uh, on this uh, topic. It's, it's, an era, it's an area where, where Austria has a lot of uh, know-how and competence, and, and that's why we focus uh, on this uh, part of Europe. Um, with, the, with this huge number of questions, uh, we have to ask ourselves, where can we start? Where should we start? Uh, our chancellor's uh, motto is that uh, the EU should tackle the large topics and leave the uh, smaller, smaller things to where they belong, uh, to the uh, local, regional, national level. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the topic of subsidiarity is quite important for us, uh, not least, as, as, as I uh, mentioned before, because we come from, we, we live in a country which, uh, uh, where, where decisions are being made bottom up, and um, uh, we will have a conference in, in Austria in, well, actually next week, I think it is in 1516, uh, trying to further the, the principle of subsidiarity within the European Union. Um, Austria uh, tries to act as an honest broker in the presidency. The, the topics uh, we, we chose are not for our, uh, for our national uh, advancement, but we try to, to work for the, for the, for the better of uh, Europe, and uh, this broker role to a certain extent is what we can also bring into the uh, Brexit debate. Uh, the, uh, the structure of the negotiations and the structure of the procedures does not allow uh, a lot of activities uh, on the national or presidency level, but our prime minister has been very active uh, in, in, in uh, difficult to say, in, 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 in advancing the negotiations or in, in convincing the, par the, the parties uh, to find uh, solutions. He was in, uh, right at the, at the beginning of the presidency, he was in, in London, and uh, on today's Thursday on Monday, I think, uh, he had a telephone conversation with the prime minister. Uh, we are doing what we can, of course, our, uh, our scope of, of, of uh, activities is, uh, limited. Um, I think uh, so far most uh, participants are happy with, and, and I must also say that, for example, the Salzburg uh, summit, which was really a quite uh, important event in Brexit, 
was not meant to discuss Brexit at all. Uh, uh, our Prime Minister opened the, the summit to the Brexit discussion. Originally, it was, originally it was planned only for, uh, for migration and security purposes, but of course uh, we tried to use the opportunity to have the state, head, heads of state and government in Salzburg to, uh, to talk about Brexit as well. So these are the little things that we can uh, bring into, into Brexit. Um, so far, uh, there's any number of, uh, of ministerial events that have taken place, uh, I think mostly in, in a very constructive atmosphere. And uh, the pace will continue. We will have uh, a high-level forum uh, between leaders of Europe and Africa in Vienna in December, uh, which will try to tackle the migration question uh, in cooperation with those uh, who are the, uh, the countries of origin and uh, or countries of transit and try to uh, to work out solutions uh, with them. And uh, one thing I want to point out at this uh, stage is that we are the presidency of the 28. Uh, it's not the EU against the UK. We are trying to work for Europe for all 28, as long as we are 28. We have uh, pointed this out to the uh, UK government. I do not see us in different uh, camps. We are one, at least until the 29th of March uh, 2019. But uh, as long as, okay. <laughs> that, that, was, <laughs> that was the final sentence anyway. No, no, thank you, Your Excellency. And it was absolutely fascinating. But I know that a number of members have questions that they wish to ask you. So if it's all right if I stop you there uh, and move on to questions, uh, thank you very much. Um, could I uh, ask, um, you, you talked about your President's uh, visit uh, to, to London. I understand that um, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has visited Austria. I believe the Foreign Secretary and some other ministers have visited Austria and that has been seen as an attempt by the UK government to, to lobby Austria as an individual member state and also as a, the pre current presidency uh, to influence uh, the course of the Brexit negotiations. How successful has that been for the UK government? I, th well, I think we do not uh, interpret the motives of, 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 of the uh, uh, UK government, when they when they uh, visit us, uh, visit uh, Austria and talk to us, we are very happy about uh, uh, these uh, meetings. We gain a lot of important information, um, but I think uh, uh, the the structure is very clear. Uh, Michel Barnier is negotiating. He has a clear mandate. The mandate is adapted by the uh, European uh, Council Article 50, uh, and there has been no uh, no change in that there is no bilateral uh, tracks. Yeah, and, and one thing that this committee met, Michel Barnier, um, about a year ago now, and uh, then as now, he was very clear that the, the four freedoms of the single market uh, could not be tampered with. Um, is that something that you are in agreement with? Um, I think that's fully the position of the Austrian government as well. Yes, thank you very much. Annabel Ewing. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Ambassador, and thank you very much for your interesting opening statement. We do indeed live uh, in interesting times, uh, and uh, at this stage, the, there are so many unknown unknowns, to coin a phrase, that it's very difficult to have a rational um, discussion. But just picking up on a very factual point, and I, and I appreciate from your perspective as, as Ambassador that it may not be within your particular uh, knowledge in terms of the detail, but it was just something that was adopted during the Austrian presidency, which I hadn't really been aware of, and that was a new uh, European Travel Information and Authorization System, ETIAS mm -hmm. is the acronym. And this is to apply to visa-exempt third country nationals, and they will need to obtain a travel authorization before their trip via an online application. For each application, the applicant will be required to pay a travel authorization fee of seven euros. So really, um, I don't think this is widely known uh, amongst potential travellers in the UK in terms of, you know, obviously at this point of the year, they may be looking to book holidays next year and so forth. Um, so I, I, I'm, I guess I'm seeking some clarification as to what is the intended impact at the moment of this system on UK nationals, um, certainly during the transition period, 
whatever that may be, uh, and obviously beyond. So uh, after Brexit, if that indeed takes place, it would be really helpful if you had any thoughts to give us this morning on that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the system itself is a major um, building block of, uh, of European uh, security. Uh, the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, it will. Um, it was signed by the. Uh, the regulation was signed by the Austrian presidency and the European Parliament. It has been through the whole uh, process of the European uh, Parliament. It uh, will allow for much better control of uh, who enters uh, the EU, um, and um, I think the, uh, the the basic fee will not uh, will not change. A lot, because uh, as it is, if you're looking especially at, at, at countries who need a visa for the EU, they have to pay anyway, and mm. uh, uh, the seven euros will not not make much uh, difference. Um, I, as far as the application of, of this during the transition period is concerned, I do not have any okay. concrete information, but I'm pretty sure it will not be used against UK citizens or against the movement between the UK and, okay, and, and the continent. Okay, but obviously we would yeah. probably wish to seek some clarification because that's yep. an important practical consideration, yep. one of many. I mean, but just in terms of the broader um, mm -hmm. intention behind the system, and you mentioned security, very important. So I, I take it, therefore, that implicit in a system of authorisation, albeit it falls short of a visa system, but implicit in a system of authorisation is presumably the possibility that in certain circumstances authorisation will not be granted. And I guess we have to find out more information about the practicalities of mm -hmm. applying for this, the lead-in time, the time it takes to make a for the authorisation to come through and so yeah, forth, because... Yeah, yeah with many of these systems, it's not exactly instantaneous for, for obvious reasons. So mm -hmm. this is another, uh, yet another area of concern to individuals in Scotland, uh, I, I, I'm sure, uh, that uh, uh, results from the whole Brexit burich, as they say in certain parts of Scotland. Yeah, think about, but this, as, as far as uh, the um, as an entering your, your data is concerned, when, when I travel, when I fly to the UK, uh, when checking in, I have to put, put in my personal data. My yes, data absolutely. Is... But my point is that an authorization system, by the by the title of, of this, by the nature of the word authorization, presupposes that in certain circumstances, perhaps authorization would not be uh, mm -hmm. granted. And I think we need to get to the bottom of what that would look like. But um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was perhaps. Between you and the, the spot. <laughs> thank you very much, Tavi Scott. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador. Firstly, thank you for your remarks um, at the, and your opening remarks to the uh, uh, to the, to the uh, convener. Some of us met uh, your colleague Franz Fischler many years ago on fisheries matters. I don't know what she, Mr. Fischler, her Fischler, is uh, doing these days, but he was certainly a robust character when it came <laughs> to fisheries is, yeah. policy some years back. Um, uh, you're very diplomatic, if I may say so. Um, the uh, question I actually want to ask was about the transitional period. Um, and your perspective um, in convening the presidency of the union at this time, where, what, what you, um, where you guess that transitional period will, will, will extend to, what uh, time period? We're being told it's going to be, uh, or the current thinking is 18 months, but do you foresee circumstances where that could be extended given the complexity of what may have to be discussed and arranged um, from March of 2019 onwards? Uh, I, I'm afraid that this is far beyond my <laughs> my level even to give any uh, personal assessment. Uh, it, it, it will be a crucial point in the in the final uh, negotiations, uh, and and that's kind of the point. It's it'll be decided. That detail, do you think, will be concluded in those final negotiations? I could imagine that it's one of the points where uh, which constitute the final. Uh, Agreement, but uh, so individual I, member states, and in your case, the presidency, uh, very much leave that matter, as you said earlier, on to the convener to the to Michel Barnier to, in terms of the the detail. I, th I think we would go, we would get a lot, go a long way to support a yeah. uh, a solution of the of, of of the question. Yeah, yeah, okay. But well, my apologies for asking an unfair <laughs> question. No, no. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Neil Finlay. Yeah, um, I noticed the. Uh, Governing coalition in Austria has members of the uh, far right in powerful positions, um, uh, and that they, you mentioned the fight against migration has been a priority. What impact are the um, uh, the far right 
partners in the coalition having on Austrian politics, but also the presidency? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, our Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, uh, he was uh, foreign minister for four years, uh, foreign minister during the uh, migration crisis, but uh, he started his uh, working government as uh, uh, state secretary for integration matters, uh, which means that he has been with this topic for six or seven years now, and, and he is really uh, someone who has the, the experience, who has the outlook, who has the know-how uh, to tackle these uh, questions. Uh, the, uh, he is also the, uh, the, the, the minister with, the, with overall uh, responsibility. In a coalition government, naturally, the views of uh, all coalition partners uh, come in, but uh, decisions are uh, taken by the Council of Ministers with, uh, unanimously. Uh, and uh, that way you have one uh, government position. Uh, the, uh, the question of migration is a question that does not even only concern the, the parties in government, but all the other parties um, as well. And I think uh, the <clears throat> any, any decision taken by the government now uh, reflects uh, the, the result of the elections, re re reflects the, the, the will of the electorate. But uh, if, if you're talking about concrete uh, questions, we, we can look into it. But I think in, in general, it, it, it is, it is a one government policy. And uh, in relation to the issues around migration, the, um, we see every year thousands of migrants, um, many dying in the Mediterranean, drowning in the Mediterranean. Is it the view of the uh, Austrian government and the presidency that uh, come what may, uh, you know that that's just a consequence of having a very of having a secure EU border. Uh, um, is there no mm -hmm. um, acknowledgement that there's an absolute failure to deal with the whole issue around migration when we see thousands of poor people drowning in the Mediterranean? Um, uh, it is clear that that uh, the. Uh, that the measures that had been taken in the past years were not sufficient to prevent uh, tragedies like that. But as far as the cause of these tragedies is concerned, uh, uh, we're also looking uh, very hard at the criminal networks that actually caused them uh, the, the tragedies in the Mediterranean. Uh, have a business component in terms of uh, criminal business and. Uh, if you, tack if you tackle the problem as a whole, you must also tackle that problem. And does the Austrian government support freedom of movement within the EU? Absolutely. But not freedom of movement one inch outside the EU? That, 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 no, 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 that, that's, that's, that, that's definitely not our position. Uh, there is movement and there is illegal movement. There is a, 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 a wide range of, uh, of regulations that allows, furthers uh, and, and, and extends legal movement, but there is also a point where you come into the, into the area of illegal movement. And if illegal movement as defined by laws uh, takes place, the governments have the, the duty uh, to stop that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Ambassador, and thank you for coming. C can I continue the thread, um, given that in your opening statement you said that one of the three key priorities for the Austrian presidency was the issue of migration uh, on the European continent? Um, can you comment on, and I and appreciate uh, in your role, it's, I'm not asking you to comment on domestic political matters, those are matters for domestic politicians, but I think it is important because I think the domestic politics of the country which holds the presidency can influence its neighbouring countries. The reason I say that is that, um, as you will be aware, Austria uh, has uh, decided not to sign up to the uh, Global Compact for Migration, uh, the UN's scheme alongside some of its neighbouring countries such as Hungary, Hungary, Czech Republic 
and uh, from what I can read in the news this week, perhaps Croatia as well, and Poland. So I think that that regional influence, uh, that cluster of regional countries, which has a, a certain view on this, this accord, um, seems to be a, a theme which is coming through. Uh, to quote from uh, the Austrian Vice Chancellor, he said that migration is not and cannot become a human right. I wonder if you could just elaborate what he perhaps meant by that. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, the regional aspect in this context is not. Uh, um, there is a context because uh, the countries you mentioned were all hit by the migration crisis. There is no. Uh, sort of bilateral uh, consultation about that. These are the decisions that are really taken by the individual governments, not as a group or not uh, not in an uh, in an organised uh, matter. Plus, you have other countries like the United States of America, which uh, will not uh, sign uh, the compact. Um, I think in in. In the light of the of the events of the last years, we were, our people were going very hard over every detail of the compact, and there is a number of, uh, of points, concrete points, in there uh, where we feel that they, in in, in the current form, uh, to, do not reflect what our government. Uh, Expects uh, from the compact, and there is—it's not uh, not not a, not a general question. There is, um, you know, 15 or 20 uh, single questions where we do not feel that the compact gives the uh, uh, a satisfying answer, or or makes the difference between legal and illegal uh, migration clear enough. Mm -hmm. and, and has that decision been, uh, been influenced by the makeup of your uh, domestic government? And uh, if so, has that affected, do you think, uh, the stance that your, your country has taken uh, on that uh, accord? Because I think, on one hand, the, the narrative uh, with regards to your presidency is about tackling and helping uh, uh, migrants, but, uh, by, but on, a, on, a, on a state sovereign level, not uh, signing up to some of the schemes that may do just that. So there seems to be a, a conflict mm -hmm. of, of views out there. I think maybe, maybe one of the lessons of the past years was that the sort of the, the political, the abstract political uh, declarations should not uh, float away from from real life or the the feeling of uh, or the, the the opinion of the of the population and to to uh, enshrine something which of which you know that it might not be kept or that it might not be able to uh, uh, to to implement uh, is is in a way is in a way dangerous if you're not fully convinced of something I th uh, that's the view of our government if you're not fully convinced of, of something like the compact if you're not fully agree with the provisions uh, it's probably better to say it at the right moment and not regret it uh, a few years later okay and uh, if I could perhaps move off of the issue of migration onto another of your important subjects the convener will allow me and that's stabilization of of eastern Europe, uh, 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 the Balkans, uh, and even perhaps an extent the, the Baltic states as well, uh, with their proximity to mm -hmm. our neighbouring Russia. Yep. Um, w what is the Austrian presidency's views on uh, how robust it will be uh, with Russia specifically, uh, or how the EU should deal with that issue? Uh, and I say so in the context that uh, many uh, European countries uh, rely on Russia for uh, large uh, sums of, of energy, uh, 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 particularly gas. I know Austria, for example, uh, imports uh, huge amounts of gas from Russia, uh, over 9 billion uh, cubic metres in 2017. That's a 50% increase. 2018 already has su superseded that. So with that reliance on the state of mm -hmm. Russia, how confident are you that mm -hmm. the Austrian presidency will be robust with Russia? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, we support... Uh uh, we support, uh, we're fully supportive, of course, of the EU sanctions and EU policy uh, against Russia. As far as uh, energy imports is concerned, uh, 
yes, the numbers you, you, you mentioned are right, but uh, in terms of dependence, uh, it's uh, far less than some of our neighboring countries. And uh, increase and decrease uh, reflects uh, changes in prices. It's, uh, it's a market uh, uh, question. Um, but uh, some uh, Southeastern and Eastern European countries are really dramatically depend on uh, Russian energy. Uh, that means that, that uh, these countries have to be stable and prosperous enough uh, to not, not to be intimidated. That's why we want to take them in the EU, that we are looking very strongly into uh, reverse flow gas pipeline systems to really uh, enable countries uh, like, like Hungary, Serbia and others uh, to decrease their dependency on, on, on Russian gas. But uh, energy dependence and, and Russian influence is only one of the problems in Southeast uh, Europe. It's a fairly recent problem. Uh, the the uh, ethnic and re religious tensions uh, in Southeast Europe go back six, seven hundred years, which is a long time even by UK standards, I think. Uh, and, and, and you really have to, to create uh, <clears throat> sort of the, the civic coherence, the, uh, the feeling of, 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 of one society in these countries. Um, parallel to uh, practical questions like energy dependence. So, uh, yes, energy dependence is an important factor, but uh, I think uh, the real problems lie deeper still. Uh, and uh, Russian influence or Russian politics is only uh, one aspect of the stabilization of uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, thank you very much for that. And just one final quick one. Do you think Turkey should or will ever join the European Union? Um, as far as we uh, see it or we uh, judge it, uh, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. Um, very conveniently, that falls on uh, exactly from Jamie Green's final question. During the course of your presidency, Europe's relationship with Turkey has become increasingly strained. That uh, did not start with uh, your presidency. It's uh, been happening for a number of years now. Um, Turkey jails more journalists than any other country on earth. It has uh, continuously and consistently attacked its own democratic opposition. Many MPs are now in jail. Um, and there's a widely held perception that Turkey has held back effective European action against it on the basis of the agreement that was reached for pushbacks of refugees trying to reach Europe uh, through Turkey. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit what action your presidency has taken to ensure that European values around a free and open democratic society are being respected in terms of our relationship with Turkey. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> actually, over the past year, uh, our bilateral relations with uh, Turkey have improved. Uh, they have been they have been worse. <laughs> Um, but uh, our government uh, doubts the, uh, the the wisdom and the bill and, 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 and ability of, of Turkey to to join the, the European Union. Uh, we see Turkey as, an, as a very important factor in uh, European uh, politics and for European future. Um, but the, the, the previous concept of, of, of Turkey marching towards full EU membership uh, for us at the moment does not seem uh, to be the right way. Uh, Turkey, uh, through its size, through its geographical position, through its NATO membership, uh, still has a lot of leverage uh, um, towards Europe. Um, the, uh, the migration crisis of 2015 um, brought that to light. Um, we have to work uh, with Turkey uh, step by step on, on, on various uh, questions, but uh, yes, the, the development of the domestic situation in Turkey gives uh, concern to, our, to us as uh, government, uh, as uh, EU uh, presidency. There is a number of Austrians who are uh, jailed in, in, in Turkey at the moment, and um, it, 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 it is one of the uh, big uh, European questions, definitely, yes. You mentioned Turkey's NATO membership, which is becoming an increasingly 
key issue in, for example, the, the Syrian civil war and uh, geopolitical relations there. But for what are other reason than Turkey's NATO membership and the refugee uh, pushback deal, uh, are there any other reasons than those for Europe's considerably constrained criticism of Turkey's actions in comparison to incredibly similar actions by Russia, for example? Um. I think the, um, geopolitics is, is a factor, and uh, so t Turkey is a, is, a, is a pretty convenient car drive away from uh, Austria, Germany. Uh, there, is, uh, there are big uh, Turkish communities uh, in, in, in Germany, Austria especially, Switzerland as well. Um, uh, Business is important, trade is important. We, Turkey cannot be uh, ignored or, 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 or cut off. Uh, it has to be a question of, uh, of continuous uh, dialogue, which is not really being facilitated by the uh, Turkish uh, government. Um, so I don't, I don't uh, we have to work with Turkey. Uh, we do work with Turkey and uh, hopefully the situation, the situation will improve at some stage. Just one final question on what levels of cooperation are appropriate. Should Europe respect arrest warrants from Turkey that are issued on the basis of what we would consider to be purely political motivation, arrest warrants for both their own internal democratic opposition, but particularly for Kurdish activists who are not Turkish citizens? A number of Kurdish political activists from Syria who travel around Europe advocating for their cause, the democratic revolution in the north of Syria, mm -hmm. have had arrest warrants issued by Turkey that have on the whole not been respected by European nations, but on some occasions have been. Should Turkey's politically motivated arrest warrants be respected by Europe? Uh, that's a question to the respective, uh, for the respective courts. Uh, uh, and uh, when, as, as, as you mentioned, they, they take their decisions. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, at, at the moment, this is, uh, is very much a judicial uh, decision which does not fall within the remit of the EU presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, uh, Convener. It's still on the issue of human rights, but with regard to Poland and Hungary, how, how concerned is Austria uh, with the situations in both uh, Hungary and uh, Poland where authoritarianism seems to be uh, growing? Mm -hmm. um, that's very simple. Austria supports the Article 7 uh, procedures uh, within the EU. Um, no ifs and buts. Thank you for that clarification, which I think is, uh, is important to have on the record. Can, can I also ask, um, one of the issues uh, 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 with regard to uh, Brexit is, of course, that the UK's financial contribution to the um, net, net financial contribution to the European Union means there's going to be a hole in terms of the budget. And I'm just wondering um, what the view of the Austrian government is on that, whether uh, nations like Austria, which is already a net contributor, should increase its contributions, or there should be a reduction in the payments which go to the eastern neighbours, which we've just mentioned, including obviously those in the in the Western Balkans, and what the impact that would be in terms of relations uh, within the European Union between uh, richer nations such as Austria and uh, you know um, less prosperous ones such as, for example, Bulgaria, uh, mm -hmm. Croatia, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, w w one of the topics which I uh, could not mention in my opening statement was the multi-annual uh, financial framework, uh, which is, of course, also one of our big uh, uh, topics uh, on, the, on the technical level. Um, I think our government is very much aware of our net payer, uh, net contributor position. Um, and uh, the pit for, uh, the, 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 the shortfall uh, through the because of the lack of UK contribution, will be a, a, a major uh, topic, I think, also for the uh, uh, elections for the European Parliament. Uh, how, how will the shortfall be made up? But, but at the moment, I think we don't know yet what the real shortfall will be, and uh, when, in what stages, and, and, and to what uh, extent it will, uh, it will actually then influence the EU a budget, so this is, is very much uh, open at the moment. It has not reached, I think, fully the political level. Uh, it's still on the 
Technically, but, but you feel in next year's European elections it may be an issue between populist parties that don't want to increase the, the budget and those who feel that in, uh, uh, with regard to um, continue to use solidarity for uh, poorer states that should. Yeah, uh, that, that's definitely one, one, uh, one scenario. And, and um, yeah, we, we will see how our governments uh, decide to, 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 to look into that. Okay, just one other point, if I may, may convene it. Um, uh, you, know, you, you probably are aware of Sonia Apuncha Reichman from the University of Salzburg, who's written, who's written in, the, in the UK on a changing Europe in a publication called Negotiating Brexit, where now. And she's um, pointed out that um, some of the issues that Austria wishes to address during the presidency, presidency one of the issues was a restart to an EU debate about what policies should be EU and, domestic, and what should be domestic. And uh, she's saying that um, while a task force was set up by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker on subsidiarity, um, uh, Ms Reichman has said that so far it's produced few results. Mm -hmm. Is this a, an element that has caused some frustration for Austria? How do you feel this should uh, be taken forward? I think it's, it's not yet on the level of frustration because uh, we're not that far. I mean, the discussion is still going on. Mm -hmm. I think there, is, uh, there are productive discussions. The major step will be the conference in, in, in Bregenz uh, uh, next week. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, our, our Chancellor is very much uh, aware of, uh, of the importance of, of subsidiarity. And uh, uh, there, the task force has produced a report, I think. Um, so it's going step by step. Of course, it's one of the fundamental uh, questions and, and a question which is treated differently in each uh, country. We are very, uh, very comfortable with subsidiarity because of our history, other countries uh, less so. Um, but uh, but I, I, I do expect, or we do expect, that next week's conference will take us a step forward. And just lastly, Convino, do, do you feel that, um, or does the Austrian government feel that there should be greater subsidiarity, or that there should be a deepening of, of um, uh, relationships within the European Union and uh, more powers to the centre, or more should um, be devolved, or is the balance mm -hmm. just about right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the task, uh, Sebastian Kurz has said uh, the big tasks, security for Europe, uh, on the European level, mm -hmm. uh, small tasks on the uh, appropriate level. And do you feel we're at the, at the level just now? Or do you feel that it's tilting one too far one way or the other? What's the Austrian government uh, view? It's, um, it's hard to say because there is also the, uh, the, the question of the level playing field coming into, uh, into play. Mm -hmm and uh, the competitiveness of small and medium enterprises. Um, there are very complex questions on the, on the, on the actual, on, on the level of, of, of individuals, of individual companies, individual businesses. So I think that has to be looked into, and, and the consumer level, because the consumers deserve uh, protection, uh, notwithstanding where they live. Uh, so it has to be really treated uh, matter by matter. Um, but uh, I think our government would, would, would rather have the EU uh, not occupying itself too much with uh, detailed uh, uh, questions which ca can be solved on the local level and, and really concentrated on, on the big ones. Okay, thank you for that. Alexander Stewart. <coughs> thank you, Convener. Ahead of your presidency, there was a real expectation uh, that Austria would be a major player in some of the negotiations. Uh, that hasn't really transpired uh, to being where you are now. But can I ask what kind of impact on your work in the presidency, has the leaving of the EU had? Sorry, the... the impact that your work as the presidency has had with effect to the EU leaving, because initially there was a talk that you would be a major player in the, some of the negotiations within that process, and that hasn't happened. Uh, you've been a, a minor player in that process during your presidency. Yeah, which... Uh, um which I think is, is, is only natural and uh, is uh, appropriate. Um, I think it's, it's important for the presidency uh, not to try to put itself too much in, into the uh, foreground. Uh, we have respected that during our two previous presidencies. Um, it's, it, it, still, it still is a matter, uh, do you wait to be called or do you call somebody mm -hmm. and... Uh, um, and I think we are ready to make these calls. Our, our uh, ministers, our prime minister, our chancellor is ready to make these calls to 
to, to try to restart things, but, uh, but uh, within the uh, European, within the formal uh, framework. And during the presidency, you're, you're discussing the renegotiation of some of the funding processes that will take place in from sort of 20 to 27. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the CAP, uh, the Horizon Europe, uh, and the structural funds, uh, can you give us some impact about what's happening with those? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Among the... We are working uh, within the competitiveness uh, topic uh, on the single digital market. Uh, very important for us, the clean energy package. Um, uh, uh, environmental uh, questions are one of the uh, one of really are are uh, close to our hearts. Um, Banking union, capital markets union, to 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 continue to position Europe as a as a financial uh, player uh, as well, um, and uh, I mean there have been there have been minor successes like uh, fishing quota in the Baltic uh, Baltic Sea, uh, and, and and the whole question of of uh, of, of the, the trade off between uh, ecology, agriculture, uh, consumer protection. Uh, these are topics that, that, that where we, on, on, on the detailed level, try to, to, to advance uh, politics and advance uh, topics. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll now briefly suspend to have a changeover of witnesses. I'd like to thank uh, His Excellency very much for coming to answer our questions today and for his opening statement. And um, I will now suspend. Thank you.
Our second item of business today is an evidence session with the BBC. I would like to welcome the witnesses Anne Bulford, Deputy Director General of the BBC, Donalda McKinnon, the Director of BBC Scotland, and Steve Morrison, a member for the Member for Scotland, uh, on the BBC Board. And I would like to invite Steve Morrison to make a short opening statement. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us here today, convener. <clears throat> I hardly need to make um, a few introductions, but for those of you who haven't met us, <clears throat> I'm Steve Morrison, and I'm the member for Scotland on the BBC board. I've worked in television for 45 years, predominantly for Granada, where I was the chief executive, and then I founded All3 Media, which became the largest independent group of television production companies in the UK and currently has 20 companies around the world. I'm joined by my colleagues who have appeared before you before, Anne Bulford on my right, who is the Deputy Director General of the BBC, and Anne is responsible for, amongst other things, finance, HR, operations, design and engineering, marketing and audiences, and much more. And then, of course, you all know Donalda McKinnon on my left, who is the director of BBC Scotland and is responsible for the strategic direction and the programmes and services produced in Scotland. <clears throat> the role of the Scottish member on this new BBC board is to ensure that the views of the Scottish population are represented and reflected in the BBC's output and to engage with stakeholders and licence fee payers in Scotland to ensure that the BBC assesses and meets the needs of our diverse community. As a member of this board, obviously, I'm also involved in discussion and decision-making on the global issues facing the BBC, and also sits on the main BBC board. I chair the Scotland Committee, which oversees and monitors BBC Scotland's strategy and output. I also believe it's part of my role to help BBC Scotland wherever I can, to encourage them to be bold and ambitious in growing their output, both in Scotland and to the UK and the wider world. Before I was appointed, the BBC Director General, Tony Hall, announced plans for significant growth in the BBC's output in Scotland. With a new BBC Scotland channel launching next February, which will create 900 hours of original content a year, and an enhanced BBC Alba with new weekend news and an ambition to create an additional 100 hours of original programmes. Notably, after February, Scotland will be the only nation in the UK with two of its own dedicated BBC channels. This growth will bring significant new jobs, 80 extra roles in journalism, 50 already appointed, another 88 new jobs in digital and engineering by the end of March 2019, and with additional posts to support the new channel and growth in other parts of the BBC in Scotland, this will take us to around 270 new posts by the end of March, including 10 trainee journalists and 10 apprentices. This also includes the BBC funding of 21 local democracy reporters who work on local newspapers around Scotland. When I was appointed, I was struck by the new charter responsibility for the BBC to help grow the creative industries in the nations and regions. Consequently, I've played a part in engaging with Creative Scotland and encouraging it to strengthen its television and screen content strategy and to form a successful partnership with the BBC. A new memorandum of understanding between the BBC and Creative Scotland is nearly ready to be introduced. And I was pleased to see the Scottish Government put an extra £10 million into Creative Scotland's budget to help drive this new strategy. At the same time, as you know, Channel 4 is setting up a new hub in Glasgow, and the National Film and Television School Scotland has been set up in Pacific Quay with help from the BBC and the Scottish Government. Speaking as I do as the National Film School's first graduate, 
I'm delighted about this new development, and you'll hear more about it from Donaldo. Overall, I'm very proud to be the board member for Scotland at this point, the point of its biggest investment in programmes and services for Scotland in a generation. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. And can I take this opportunity to welcome you to your position uh, you. on the board? And thank you for that uh, very comprehensive opening statement. Uh, you will be aware that this committee has um, uh, raised the issue of the amount of the BBC licence fee uh, that is spent in Scotland. And uh, we've raised it in our most recent report into the screen sector in Scotland where we say it is too low and we've raised it repeatedly um, when the BBC come before us annually to talk about uh, their accounts. Uh, now this year um, the amount of the licence fee spent in Scotland has actually fallen uh, on last year uh, and is way behind, uh, it remains way behind Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, 60 8 per cent, uh, just over 68 per cent, uh, is uh, spent in Scotland, and that compares to 92.3 per cent in Wales and 88 per cent in Northern Ireland. Given that this issue comes up repeatedly uh, when the BBC come before the committee, why is the situation not improving? Well, thanks very much, convener. In fact, the situation is improving. In 2015-16, uh, the percentage of the licence fee spent in Scotland was 65.9%. In 2017-18, it will be 68.8%. And in the year we're in, which is 18-19, it will be 76.7%. When the new BBC channel transmits for a whole year, it will be nudging towards 80%. Now, the reason why there has been a network drop in TV spend in 2017-18 is largely due to delayed transmissions of two programmes. Ordeal by Innocence, which you'll remember was due to go out at Christmas, was delayed as the lead cast was recast and is transmitted in Easter, and Still Game, where we didn't have as many episodes within the calendar year as was scheduled. But our calculation is that over the three years that the DG promised till, Mar till April 2019, the BBC will spend an, an, an annual average of £20 million in Scotland by the end of March 2019. Now, it may be useful to hand over to Donalda to give you an illustration of the kind of programmes that we're making. That might be useful, but however, I would r rather stay on this point, if you don't mind, sure. um, because uh, the, it's really very, very striking, the difference between Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, just to repeat the figure, 68.8% for Scotland, compared to 92.3% uh, for Wales. Oh, well, I can answer that very clearly. There is no real comparison between Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Wales has been chosen by the BBC as a federal centre for drama. So you'll know programmes like Casualty, Doctor Who, Sherlock are now all produced out of Cardiff. These programmes are not portrayal programmes about Wales. They are regular programmes, standards that the BBC has made for many years. And the BBC chose to establish a major drama production centre in Cardiff, whereas before they were made elsewhere. That's why Wales has got a disproportionate amount of spend. Northern Ireland is totally different. Northern Ireland is a much smaller area than Scotland, but it still is obliged to make local news programmes and current affairs. And these programmes cost roughly the same, whatever size of the population. And therefore, it is quite natural that in a small area, their percentage of spend would be higher. May I just say, my own personal opinion about this. I do not believe that the BBC should end up trying to invest or put on the screen 100% of the licence fee in a form of quota. 
I believe we are progressing towards what will probably be around 80%. But I think the people in Scotland would appreciate big national, international programmes like the BBC World Service, the Commonwealth Games, the European Athletic Championships, uh, Blue Planet. None of these things count in the funny way that all these hours are calculated, even if, as in the case of the Athletics, the European Championship, they were, half of them were actually produced in Scotland. So we have to allow for certain, if you like, central major programmes to be funded throughout the UK, and that includes Scottish participation. Secondly, this is a creative business, and I think it's very important to give the commissioners some headroom so that they can commission the best ideas, the best dramas, the best comedies from wherever they come. Having said that, I think we're all uh, pleased to develop the percentage and increase the investment in Scotland, as I announced in my opening statement. Because in the end, what we all really want is a larger, sustainable, indigenous, creative industry of television production in Scotland. And later on in this uh, interchange, I think we should come back to that and the ways to do it because we're all really working in the same direction. I'm really surprised at what you said at the opening of your remarks there, um, Mr Morrison, where you, you said that the reason uh, for the high spend in Wales was returning network dramas, because, of course, this committee and the Screen Sector Leadership Group and just about every major uh, commentator in Scotland has commented on the fact that it's the lack of returning high-quality drama that is pushing the spend down in Scotland. And I was surprised that you, you, you're you using that as a, a justification for the figures, for, when in fact, the reason why the figures in Scotland are poor is because we don't have those kind of productions here in Scotland, and we should have those kind of productions here in Scotland. I, I'm all in favour of you, of us all, having more returnable dramas in Scotland. The only point I was making was, if you take three bankers, which are Casualty, Sherlock and Doctor Who, and you put them in one place, they could actually be made anywhere because they're not particularly local to Wales, then you will get high numbers. It, sh it should be our objective to find dramas like Northern Ireland did uh, with Line of Duty, to find dramas that are returning, as Shetland, for example, is, is about to go into its fifth series, it should be our objective, and I'm sure it is our drama commissioner's objective, to find long-running returning series. That is the gold dust of all uh, television commissioning. Yeah, Because, of course, one of the things that our uh, inquiry into the screen sector found is that returnable dramas in terms of the creative economy and employment is, uh, creates many, many jobs. And obviously you have a, an obligation now in your charter to develop the creative economies. Uh, of, of the nations. Um, and if I could just point out that I, I thought that was quite interesting figures in terms of the BBC headcount as a share of the total population of, of that nation. Um, in, in Scotland, um, the headcount is exactly the same as Wales, um, uh, but it's a lower percentage of the population. So in terms of the population of Scotland, a much lower percentage is employed uh, by the BBC in Scotland than in Wales? Well, what I was explaining in my introduction is the BBC in Scotland is adding 270 new posts. That is a very, very large percentage of the existing headcount and will increase it quite dramatically. The reason why Wales, as I explained earlier, has a disproportionate number is that they have a very large UK-based um, drama centre which requires a lot of uh, people working on those programmes. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy to share with you the objective of finding long-running successful dramas and comedies for Scotland, from Scotland to the UK network. That is what, what we are all keen to do. And in fact, there has been a growth of drama coming out of BBC Scotland over the last three or four years. What your job on the BBC board would be to keep pushing 
for more spend in Scotland, not justifying the disparity as you're doing just now? Well, as you can imagine, I'm quite a pushy person, and Scotland, in an overall context, which is actually very challenging, as you know, the UK government has transferred to the BBC the responsibility for the over 75s free licences. And if that concession continued, that would take up 20% of the BBC's licence fee. Now, I can't really comment on that because we're going to go into a public consultation on it and then the board will discuss it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in these circumstances of this overall context, the fact is that Scotland has received over the last three years an extra £40 million a year when other nations and regions mm -hmm have had to cut their resources. But our percentage of the licence fee spent has gone down and we raise considerably more licence fee than we do in Wales. No, it's only gone down, as I explained, through timing. In this year of 17 to 18, it went up from 65.9% in 15-16 to 72.4% in 16-17, 68.8% in 17-18, and forecast to be 76.7% in 1890. Well, we'll be able to talk to you about that next when year. When we meet next year. Yes. OK, I'd like to pass on to Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. I'd like to focus on uh, BBC News and Current Affairs output at first, um, and a, a couple of specific instances that I think indicate a, a wider issue. Um, so Newsnight earlier this year ran a package uh, from the Institute of Economic Affairs, from a member of their staff, uh, advocating the privatisation of the NHS. The IEA are one of the least transparent think tanks uh, in Europe. They're registered as an education charity, uh, but there's a lot of deep scepticism about that. We do know that they're funded by uh, big tobacco companies, for example, who advocate against public health measures and clearly have a vested interest in policies related to health care. Uh, we know that the head of the IEA gave £32,000 to the now Secretary of State for health in the UK government. Uh, their head of health policy claimed all doctors are communists. And they were allowed to run a package through the BBC advocating for the privatisation of the NHS. Now, given that there is no donor transparency at the IEA, why was the BBC giving them a platform to do this? I didn't see this item, so if, if you wish, I could examine this item and write back to you as to the circumstances. That would be helpful, but I, I want to stick with this issue now because it's indicative of a, a wider issue, and I would like you to explain to me, and perhaps Anne would be able to, why does the BBC offer platforms to organisations who have no donor transparency, but for which, in this case, there is clear suspicion that private healthcare companies who have a vested interest in what this uh, package was advocating are, in fact, funding the organisation who was given the platform? What are the BBC's rules around those it has on, either as guests or, in this case, as advocates, when there is no transparency behind who funds them? Well, as I said, I haven't seen this item, so I can't really comment on this individual item. In general, the BBC has a very, very long-standing, robust process for ensuring impartiality and balance, particularly in news and current affairs. And we have a very rigorous system, if anything comes up, that goes outside those rules. I'm asking you to explain to me why organisations who have no transparency behind their financial arrangements are allowed onto the BBC to comment on issues of public policy clearly related to the organisations who are widely believed to be funding them. Well, Ross, I didn't see this item. I have no We're idea. We're not talking about the specific item. No, I'm, I'm not want, I don't want to comment on the general because I haven't seen this particular item. Well, in that case, can I ask Anne to comment on the general yeah, issue? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the editorial guidelines around selection of guests are, 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 are an area that, that we can deal with in more detail. I, I'm afraid I'm not able to comment on this specific. What I would say is that um, our job in bringing organisations on and putting their views to challenge is an important part of what we do. So I, I, I don't agree that we invite organisations on to our um, news programmes to be interviewed, uh, uh, to, to be given a platform. They're brought onto our programmes for their views to be challenged and to be interviewed and to be, and for what they're advocating to be brought out. Now, if there is a, 
a, a specific complaint where the context of those views uh, is felt not to be sufficiently clear and being made clear to our audience, and that challenge seems in some way to be um, inappropriate, then we have channels to enable people to raise complaints about that and we would consider that properly. But before it gets to the complaint process, what I'm asking again is why does the BBC as a general rule allow organisations like the IEA, like the Taxpayers Alliance, which is not a membership organisation that represents taxpayers, it's just a company owned by two guys, why are these organisations who have no transparency behind their financial arrangements allowed to comment on issues of public policy related clearly to those who are believed widely to be funding them? Well, our job is to enable a range of views to be um, put forward and for those views to be challenged through our journalism. As I say, the very specific point that you raise, um, we can look at that um, and, and reply on that point. It's not, it's not an issue that's been raised with me before, um, but my clear understanding of what we seek to do in our journalism is to challenge, not to provide platform. I don't regard that as a satisfying answer, but I don't think we're going to get any further. Um, to move on to, to a related issue, but not, uh, not around um, financing, uh, you'll be aware of the controversy around uh, the invitation of uh, the white nationalist uh, Steve Bannon to uh, a BBC EBU uh, event that the First Minister has withdrawn from. At what point do you have to balance out what you would regard as public interest of challenging views, which I accept that those arguments have been rehearsed, uh, with views that are simply beyond the pale of uh, acceptable public debate, no matter how wide you try and have the spectrum for acceptable public debate? The, the First Minister said that the BBC's response to her described Mr Bannon as a powerful and influential figure promoting an anti-elite movement. Well, he promotes a pro-white movement. He is a white nationalist. At what point is someone beyond the pale? I mean, you wouldn't have someone who would advocate Holocaust denial. Steve Bannon has associated with Holocaust deniers. Where does the line get drawn? Ask Donalda McKinnon to comment on this. First, first of all, uh, Mr Greer, uh, we respect the First Minister's decision not to participate in the News Exchange Conference. Uh, it was reported in the press that BBC Scotland had invited uh, Steve Bannon. That is not the case. Uh, the conference, as you rightly point out, is an EBU, a European Broadcaster, Broadcasting Union a conference, uh, and the BBC is a member. So there is a committee of news exchange that extends invitations to a variety of speakers and panellists. And it was decided Steve Bannon, as we know, was an advisor to the President of the United States, um, it is really important in a conference that is absolutely about journalism that we go to the heart of, uh, of our journalism and our journalistic practice, which is about holding people to account, which is about interrogating, which is about scrutiny. And it was felt by the committee who invited Steve Bannon that it was right uh, to do just that, and uh, that's why he will be there. Do you recognise the concern about this, but it's not just on... Mr. Bannon's history as a white nationalist, but the long history of the platforming of those of extreme far-right views under the guise of challenging them for those views, but which has resulted in the absolute opposite. We've got a, a solid century's worth of evidence of that being the case. I recognise the concern, but again, it is not our intention in the BBC to offer platforms to people who have particularly extreme views, it is about holding them to account, interrogating, scrutinising and explaining to others what they're about. That's not the game they play and I think you're being played in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask a supplementary on that particular point. Right, it will have to be very quick. Cause it was just to say, is it not the case time? that Nick Griffin's appearance on Question Time actually ultimately <laughs> led to the d effective destruction yeah. of that political yeah. party? by exposing his ludicrous yep. views to the rest of uh, the United Kingdom, who perhaps were not directly aware of them, and uh, the party went in a precipitous decline uh, uh, as a result of that. I'm not sure if that was a question or not. I think I should like to move on to Annabel. I'd like to move on to Annabel Ewing now. Okay, thank you, computer. Uh, good morning. Um, I, on the subject of BBC Alaba, uh, Mr. Morrison uh, referred to that in his introduction to say there's going to be a new weekend news um, programme or plans of some description. And 
uh, there'll be an additional 100 hours. I don't know, is that 100 hours over what period? I don't know, is that a one-off 100 hours? But um, obviously, in terms of the report we have before us, we can see that, in fact, over the last year, in terms of number of hours, there has, in fact, been an overall decrease uh, in genres such as drama, comedy, entertainment, music and art of 8.6% reduction in hours over the last year. And as far as children, uh, children programmes or related programmes, um, there has been a reduction over that period of 8.6%. So perhaps we could hear why that is. And secondly, if the plans that Mr Morrison referred to uh, are, are just bringing you back to where you were, uh, because it seems that that's quite a considerable drop uh, in terms of these uh, particular genres. Well, I'm going to ask Donalda to talk um, more closely about BBC Alba, but I just wanted to say that over the last three years, we have increased our investment in BBC Alba from £5.5 .5 million a year and to this year, which is not in your current uh, brief because we're looking at last year, but last year we spent 7.9 million and this year we're in, we're going to spend 9.1 million. Now I recognise the two things you refer to, which are the weekend news and the extra hours of programming, and particularly children's. Donalda, do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, so I think um, what you're seeing there is a fluctuation in terms of uh, the numbers of repeats of programmes in, in, in these genres that you identify. And in any given year, you will have a fluctuation in the numbers of programmes in these areas uh, that are transmitted on BBC Alpha. As Steve uh, has just said, we have continued to increase our investment in BBC Alpha. We did, in fact, uh, introduce weekend news, weekend news on television and indeed on Radio and Gale. Uh, on Saturdays and Sundays to coincide with the BBC Alpha's 10th anniversary in September. Um, I'm delighted to say that uh, we are working very hard to ensure that, as I said uh, when I appeared here over a year ago, um, that we would do everything in our power to try and ensure that there was read across from the new investment into BBC Alpha in the shape of what I um, intended, which is another uh, 100 hours. Uh, Margaret Mary Murray, who heads up... So can I just clarify, so I, uh, to interrupt, is that 100 hours, is just, you know, if we use terms of 100 hours, what does that actually mean in practice? 100 hours, two hours, well, I don't know, well, sorry. What, could you explain what 100 hours means then? Is it a week, a month, a year? So, so broadly speaking, it can, it can be, you might have more hours in one, one week, week than another, but, but over if, essentially, over, over a year. 100 hours over a year, so that's like four days in a bit over a year, is that have I got my arithmetic? Two, two hours a week. Okay. Sorry, sorry continue, please continue. Okay. Yes. Just to put it in some sort of context. Yeah. Well, it's, it's significantly increasing the amount of origination on BBC Alpha, um, which has been something that has been a worry and a, a cause of concern for the Gaelic-speaking audience who want to see more originated programmes as opposed to repeats. Uh, but we've also um, been working very hard with others across the BBC to um, extend the value of what we do uh, elsewhere and with our children's department uh, for example which is based in Salford we've just recently again to coincide with the 10th anniversary uh, introduced uh, new children's programs new originations which will come up in the figures next year they're not there yet um, but we're looking at roughly 60 hours uh, a year um, of additional children's uh, originations and then over and above that um, some reversioning in that area it's also been a strategic um, ambition for BBC Alba to concentrate on children and young people, um, given the growth uh, of, of uh, numbers of speakers in that, in that area. Um, well, thank you. I mean, obviously, in terms of the, the reference that Mr Morrison made to the uh, overall budget increase that we've not yet seen the figures for over the last year of some two million or so, I mean, obviously, that represents, I would imagine, possibly around a couple of years' salary for some of the BBC's highest paid uh, 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 presenters and executives, but be that as it may, um, I, I just am concerned about uh, the impact or potential impacts on the screen sector in Scotland and all the excellent uh, potential technicians and, and so forth, all the production team. I mean, what analysis does the BBC in Scotland carry out in terms of uh, making decisions about outputs and so forth? And in this instance, we're talking about BBC Alaba. Uh, and at the same time, the potential impacts on the screen sector uh, in Scotland? Well, currently, um, for BBC Alpha and indeed for, for the new Scotland Channel, we're working with, for the new Scotland Channel, around about 70, 75 um, different companies. 
Um, I think that uh, will ensure a lot of job creation in the market over and above the, the job creation that Steve um, uh, mentioned in terms of uh, what we do within in the BBC, but also for BBC Alpha. BBC Alpha commissions about 75%, sometimes more than that, of its output from uh, independent production companies. So I think, you know, aside from the spend on the actual programmes, then, then again is the multiplied effect. So for every pound, I think what that translates into at least two pounds of value. So I think, I think the investment is significant, and, and I do think that we are encouraging um, skills, um, new... Uh, um, we have lots of training schemes. We have, um, aside from uh, NFTS, which Steve mentioned, we've also got apprentices. We have journalism trainees. We've recruited about 51 new journalism positions of the 80 that we have to uh, uh, recruit for the, for the new service for the new nine o'clock news. One, okay, of the well, first, uh, one of the first things I was very fortunate to do when I was appointed was I was taken by Margaret Mary Murray to Inverness and Skye. And in Skye, they were making in the Gaelic speaking further education college, the Gaelic drama Bannon, which has actually been very successful. And for the size of that channel was quite a very, a very significant undertaking, much more expensive than you would expect. Well, we, we hear what you say today, and obviously the proof will be in the pudding. So, again, we look forward to, but I'd also like see, to see, see where we are next year. Thank you. A lot of members uh, wish to come in. Alexander. Thank you. You talk about being ambitious and bold. Uh, and we've already heard that there are a number of occasions uh, where there seems to be an, a decrease in some areas. And especially when we're looking at the local content, uh, there has been uh, a, a decrease in that. Can I ask why, why that has been uh, prioritised in that way? The, the local spend for this year is 0.9 million uh, down from 2016-17 and 2017-18. Now, in 2016-17, the figures benefited from two series of two doors down, which transmitted in the financial year compared to one series in 2017-18. And the cost of comedy is such that not having a series of comedy would easily take up that kind of sum of money. In addition, the transmission of Still Game Series 8 crossed the two financial years, with two episodes transmitting in the 2018-19 financial year, which is not the year that you're, that you're referring to, but it's just an accident of timing and, and the availability of talent uh, that just pushed two episodes out of one financial year into another. So there's no intent here to reduce the local spend, quite the opposite. OK, you, you talk about the availability of talent. I think one of the biggest issues that the BBC have faced of late has been the gender pay gap, uh, uh, and that has uh, rocked uh, the BBC, uh, shocked uh, the community at large, and it has damaged the reputation of the BBC. So can I ask how BBC Scotland are tackling that issue to ensure that we here in Scotland are, are, are seen uh, as, as managing that crisis that you now face? Well, can I ask both Anne and Donalda to respond to this, because they both have very strong responsibilities in this area. Thank you. So in terms of the gender pay gap overall, what we reported in um, the uh, financial year that we're looking at here is a reduction in the gender pay gap across the whole of the BBC uh, from 9.3 to 7.6, which um, is, is not where we want to be. We're working to drive that down further, um, but uh, it represents some good progress in mm -hmm. the year. Um, the gender pay gap in Scotland, it was a bit lower when we reported in the previous year. Uh, we don't collect and audit and, and take the gender pay gap right down in every part of, of the organisation because it's a statutory reporting mechanic at a point in time. Um, but the gender pay gap in Scotland was a bit lower than the overall BBC one based on our internal estimates and it's similarly come down over the years. So that's the position on the gender pay gap. A lot of the gender pay gap, uh, the vast majority of it, uh, like many organisations, comes through from structural issues. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, by that, there, there, are, there are two uh, big drivers. One is that uh, there are, is an imbalance of women in senior, still in senior leadership. So overall, uh, representation of women in the BBC is at about 48%, but representation in senior leadership groups is lower, at 42 43 
-hmm. And the second um, structural um, issue is around not enough women in some of the higher paid jobs, in particular in STEM-based technology jobs. And we have that challenge along with everybody else. So one of the things which I think is very, very encouraging about some of the new jobs in Scotland is of the jobs that Steve uh, referred to at the start of the session, uh, towards 90 of those are in technology, mm -hmm. which is great because that's part of, of the BBC that's growing in new technologies, in digital technologies. And um, something like 40% of those roles that have been recruited so far have been to women, which is a, a really good feeder improvement. So. The, 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 the BBC is working very hard on all issues of, of driving the gender pay gap. That structural issue about what we need to do to encourage our women to progress and to move through the organisation into more senior roles and into those areas of the BBC where they're underrepresented, in some cases where they're higher paid, was really at the heart of the career progression study uh, that, that Donalda led here from Scotland, but on behalf of the whole of the BBC. And that was one of five studies um, that we did with our staff, um, consulting widely about barriers to progress. And so we've completed similar studies around disability, which was published earlier this mm -hmm. week, which I led, social inclusion, led by my colleague Alan Davey, who runs um, uh, Radio 3, uh, BME read by, led by Tim Davey, uh, who is responsible for BBC Studios on the, on the main board with me, and also LGBT, which we looked at. But I think pertinent to your question, the most important is actually the work undertaken uh, uh, very uh, successfully by, by Donalda. So I don't know if you'd like to talk about that and maybe some of the local initiatives in Scotland on yeah. progression. So, um, as Anne said, I, I undertook um, that piece of work uh, on behalf of the BBC, so consulted widely across the BBC, not just within this country, but around the world. Um, and we came up with 33 recommendations, loosely falling under three themes. One, which was how we support career progression um, and in, in how we do that, uh, it, we had to identify in the first instance, you know, why there was such attrition at mm -hmm. particular levels or at times in people's careers. And usually it would be around when, when women were having children and leaving for maternity leave and then either not returning or indeed not, not applying for um, senior leadership positions. So um, we're also in recommending that um, training, uh, leadership training and management training are offered at every level. Um, and then the other theme uh, was around flexibility, flexible working yeah. and how... Um, so we wanted to offer flexible work, not just to women, actually, but to men as well, um, and to make it the default position a, across the BBC. Um, and then there's also something around recruitment. And uh, on that, a, we have a particular opportunity in Scotland now, I believe, to um, experiment and pilot in terms of how we go about recruiting. And with colleagues elsewhere in the BBC who are also looking at this, um, we have undertaken with all these new positions um, to increase their targets in terms of all the protected uh, characteristics that uh, Anne referred to there, but particularly as far as gender balance is concerned. And so far in our news recruitment, um, we have 52% uh, of, of women appointed uh, to the roles. And somebody did uh, ask me the question recently, you know, were we in some way uh, in danger of, of, of harming quality or um, recruiting the right people if we were making these kinds of interventions? Can I just say this is absolutely within all kinds of quality legislation um, adhering to that, but also um, that we are actually um, sourcing excellent women who will be brilliant in the, in the jobs that they have been appointed to. And I think you know, you, you've identified that you, you're tackling that issue uh, and you've been late to the table in, in some respects in comparison with some other organisations and, and structures around. Uh, and, and you're learning from other organisations what you can achieve and how you can, how you can progress that. Uh, yeah. and, and can I ask, how, how, how will that eventually be audited and, and scrutinised to ensure that we will see a, a trait coming through? Uh, it's not just a, a blip in the system, uh, or you've, you've attempted to support some mechanism to enhance it for a short time space? We've already set our targets for 2020, and... Um 
So um, I, I think there's uh, there's a few levels. First of all, the statutory pay gap is published annually and is audited, so that's a that's a hard thing. Uh, secondly, our disclosure of people of the highest paid people from the licence fee is another measure that that is monitored, and we can speak more about that if if that's helpful. Um, but in addition, what the uh, the um, executive board will have is uh, uh, both the specific recommendations for each of the studies and a consolidated view of them so that we can monitor on a regular basis progress against those actions and uh, the BBC board can take additional insurance on that as, as needs be. But ultimately, the measure will be that the targets that we've set for representation are achieved. Okay, thank you. We have a supplementary on that topic. Yes, from Annabelle. Annabelle. just a very brief supplementary. I just would be, uh, and I think we'd all be curious to know, uh, 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 currently as we speak, how many women in BBC Scotland are paid less than uh, their male counterparts for doing effectively the same job, and that is across the BBC as a whole. How, how many women, what is the scale of the problem in terms of the actual pay gap at BBC Scotland? The gender pay gap uh, in BBC Scotland is around 7.4%. Uh, yes, but how many, you know, we're talking about individual yeah. people's salaries. So how the, many women the, are affected by the that? The position in terms of looking at pay and, equal, and questions of equal pay, which, of course, is different from the gender pay gap, which is at the heart of your uh, question, as, as I understand it, um, we have undertaken fundamental reform of the way in which we manage pay in the BBC. Yeah, I, I have listened to that and I think that's all positive, yes. although so it should what, be speeded up. But I am asking the question, do you not know how many women are affected at the moment as we speak at BBC Scotland? I can tell you how many women have outstanding questions with us about their pay, which we've not yet worked through. So at the moment, we have 12 women in BBC Scotland who have asked us to look at their pay in a way that we're seeking, and we see, because our, our mechanic with this is we audit, we check, we look. And if we find issues, we correct them. And that's it is the heart of the reform of our pay and conditions that we've undertaken. In addition to that, uh, anybody across the BBC, men and women, can raise questions about their pay, name comparators, and ask, them, ask us to look at those. And we've had very many queries come up across the whole of the BBC about that. The vast majority of them are very straightforward, please check my pay. Some of them are very much more serious questions of equal pay, which date back over many years, as everyone will be aware. We deal with those um, um, questions as they come up and seek to resolve them. At the end of last week, which was, and I look at progress on cases every week uh, in an effort to progress and speed up. I want these cases dealt with as quickly as possible, just as everyone else does. Um, when I looked at those figures at the end of last week, there were 12 people in Scotland, um, I, I believe they're all women, who've asked us to look at their pay and look at it through that informal resolution stage. I don't know whether some of those will result in, in pay increases, either forwards or backwards, until that work is complete. And there are four women in Scotland who've moved on to the more, who've asked us to move on to the more formal um, uh, grievance stage where there are independent, uh, there's an independent um, person sitting along the BBC case manager from outside of the division looking at the case. That doesn't answer your question because I don't know the outcome of those cases, but those are the cases where the question's been raised right now. Okay, thank you for that, uh, and we'll wait and see what happens. Obviously, it's a shame that the BBC has taken so long, really, to, to deal with the muddle that has been created, but... Thank you. Know. So, just to clarify, so there's 16 in all. There, there's 12 That are plus under four. review at the moment. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Jamie Green. At, at, at different stages, and, and, and Convener, I, I know you want to move through the agenda, but just to be clear, when we're speaking about informal resolution, we're not talking about something which lacks rigour. That is a, a serious piece of work with HR professionals and um, legal advice taken where needed to consider the issues carefully, however the, the question is framed. Then when it moves on to a formal stage, that's the BBC's internal formal grievance policy where there's also an independent um, person brought in to, to look at the questions raised. OK, thank you. Thank you. Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Good uh, morning, panel. Um, can I ask... Uh, I, I, can I start, first of all, by saying that I think uh, that the value for money that UK audiences get from the uh, licence fee is tremendous. I don't think that's said enough. I subscribe to a whole manner of commercial uh, content providers, Netflix, Sky, Virgin, etc. 
And I think £150 for the wide breadth of content that we get is, is excellent value. But that being said, uh, Ofcom and others have criticised the BBC for its inability to reach out to new younger audiences. In fact, one in eight young people in the UK access no BBC content whatsoever, yet presumably are still liable for their share of the licence fee. Now, I, I appreciate there have been developments for BBC Three. Uh, I appreciate there is a, a targeted push uh, with uh, new technical developments such as the Sounds app, but these in isolation do not address the fundamental problem or the existential problem that BBC has is that younger audiences are shifting to commercial content providers. Uh, what are you doing to address that? Can I answer that? Yes. Uh, um, oh, OK. The, bo the main board uh, was the first sort of organisation, because we get um, monthly audience reports, to begin to examine. And we announced in our annual report that, as you say, this was now one of the biggest issues that we were considering and working out how to correct. So the first thing is, we agree with you. We, we think that dropping off of young viewers is a very important uh, challenge to the future of the BBC. Whilst one says that, the BBC is actually the, the first media organisation which gets the most time spent by young viewers. So we are, we are losing viewers, but we're, we're still retaining viewers. Now, last week we took the Scotland Committee to Dundee, and after the committee we had an audience engagement session with about 25 18 to 34-year-olds, asking them why uh, they, they were not watching the BBC. What turned out was they were watching certain individual programmes that either they'd forgotten or had absorbed and liked, but maybe were not necessarily watching them on a BBC screen. So they might be watching them on a Netflix screen or a social media screen. So there is a question of attribution involved here, where some people don't know they're actually watching. But presumably that would be BBC worldwide content that's sold on a commercial basis, so it isn't really part of the public sector delivery of No, content. it is public service programmes, which, which have been transmitted, but are then uh, transmitted on, a, on another screen. But my view is we have to take quite a bold view of this. And the board has discussed um, what are the options available to us to capture more younger viewers. If There are basically two categories of programmes that are affected. There are the mass popular programmes which have a large quotient of young people within them, which are effectively on BBC One. And there are targeted programmes which are designed for young people with smaller audiences but get through to that age group. At the moment, they are largely seen online. So what we have to do is to examine the relationship between our television service and our online service to see how we can make more famous these programmes so that they're caught by younger viewers. For example, Killing Eve, which was a BBC Three programme, premiered on BBC One on a Saturday night and created a sufficient degree of fame that it got a huge response from people wanting to see it on the iPlayer. So we have tasked our executive, including our marketing and our content uh, and our audience management, to come up with options as to how we could address this problem and garner more young viewers. Anne. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, you raise a question we consider all the time and there's a relentless focus on it. I think it's important to set it in an overall context in that 75% uh, of young people that we speak to support the BBC's mission and 70% of them believe we do it effectively. So there's a great deal of support for the BBC amongst younger audiences still. We are, as Steve said, the largest media provider uh, for young adults still. So for 16 to 34s, uh, they're still taking eight hours a week from the BBC, uh, and that's, that's well ahead of the, of the next one. And nine in 10 young people visit BBC online in a given month. Uh, the other thing I think that's very interesting, and we pick this up um, through qualitative discussions such as the, the, the session that Steve just uh, referred to, 
is when something happens, young people still come to the BBC for their, for their news to, to feel confident about it. So uh, trust scores for the young for the BBC are uh, uh, 50, well above 50% versus single digits, low single digits, for example, for Facebook. But, uh, but our view of it is that if there isn't a single answer to it. We have to work on everything and think about youth. So that's casting, that's tone of voice, that's the, how we manage through the schedule breaks, how we uh, reach out to people, the tone of, of our, of our programming. And at the heart of it is, is also uh, using um, BBC online services and the, the sign-in mechanic and the opportunity to personalise and direct uh, material that we think is going to be right for audiences from the whole of the BBC's catalogue in a very, very focused way. So we now have 33.5 million signed-in users. Very many of those are young people. And there's an opportunity there to... Mar market's not a word we use a lot, but to, to market and to show them the breadth and the range that we have in the BBC and to encourage them to come to us. And alongside all of that, um, one of the other areas that we've redirected resources is into children's programming and to increase um, focus there and, and allow this balance between investment in linear and investment in digital services to, to encourage children to come to the BBC so that they, they know us and love us in the, in the way that previous generations have. But okay. overall, uh, Jamie, if I may address you su such, we're with you on this. We are looking very, very hard. hard at providing more space and making that space more visible and more famous for young people. I appreciate your, your, your warm words and, and actions on that, and I, I do wish you the, the best of luck. It's a competitive environment to operate in that, to that audience. If I could move on to, I think my, one of my colleagues is going to talk about the new channel, but if I could open up that discussion by just asking a short question on it. One is a technical one, and that's why is the BBC taking the decision not to broadcast that channel fully in HD on digital terrestrial? Uh, and chosen only to deliver it uh, on an evening slot. I presume it's due to availability of capacity on the transponder, the multiplexes. But it, is that because there is simply no more capacity available or because you've made, taken a financial decision that's too expensive to do so? That's the first question, and, and I'll park that. And the second, perhaps, is to Mr Morrison, or Steve, if I may. Um, and that's... Uh, and, and that's the, the fact that you come from an interesting background and in that you've worked in the commercial production sector. Do you genuinely think that the uh, introduction of a new BBC Scotland channel will create real opportunities in the independent production sector? And if so, could you quantify what, what that may be? OK, should we start with the technical one? Thank you. So, um, in terms of... You are right to identify that, is, that Spectrum is, is very expensive and to purchase it would have been... I believe um, not particularly good value for money, given that the BBC will ultimately want to migrate to internet protocol transmissions. Um, so what we have secured, however, is HD on all the platforms, um, except Freeview between the hours of midday and seven o'clock, but it will transmit in HD in the evenings. And that happened um, by way of a CBBC forfeiting some of its HD spectrum in order to allow us to do that, for which we're very grateful. Julia, I mean, uh, you know, with the greatest respect, uh, does that mean that daytime audiences are forced to watch the programme in SD and evening audiences, uh, the people who are working during the day, can enjoy it in HD? You know, in a modern day and age when you're trying to compete, uh, and, and, uh, as we just discussed uh, with commercial operators, you know, do you really think people are content with SD broadcasts on big screens these days? No. I think there's a balance to be struck, isn't there? And also it depends on the nature of the programming that's on. But, but the, the striking a balance between investment in distribution across multiple platforms, which is very, very expensive, um, versus investment in content is the, one of the judgments that we, we've had to make in looking at the setup of the new channel. And the view that we took was we wanted HD, uh, but we wanted to do that where, it, where the affordability versus the audience, given what we're putting on, versus investment in content worked. So that, that was the balance that we took. And I think it's pretty good. And of course, it, there is um, HD available over IP during the day as well. Okay, I hope you don't think that means that nobody's going to watch during the day, so it doesn't matter. Not at all. No, I don't. <laughs> Absolutely not. To be clear, are 7 o'clock to midnight. Yeah. Um, so it is 
in the main and evening service, okay. other than um, when we wish to schedule First Minister's questions, for example, or sporting events. Uh, yeah. Going back to your... Three other members that need to ask questions, and our time is quite limited. Uh, Neil Finlay. Thanks. Um, feel free. Thanks to... Uh, if Neil would allow me, could I just answer Jamie's bigger Very question? Very quickly, please. Okay. Um, you're right. I, I have launched four channels myself over the years, and launching a channel is very, very, very difficult because you have to get the public to be aware that that channel has been launched, which you shouldn't assume they are aware, and to know the button, the spot on the EPG on whichever system they're watching television, and then they have to feel it's a channel for them. And these are all big things. You're, you're launching a new proposition. However, I think the progress so far suggests that the production community, which you mentioned, the independent community in Scotland, have responded to this very well. So Steve Carson, who's in charge of the overall uh, commissioning team, uh, has explained to us that they've engaged in programme commissions with 75 independent production companies. They've published programme tariffs. And there was a lot of debate at the beginning whether these programme tariffs would be high enough. And in fact, the production community have responded very well to the briefs, the commissioning briefs that were put out. Secondly, they are trying to include some higher cost genres, which they won't be able to do all the time, but to include some drama and some comedy. And in that, I think partnerships and co-commissioning between that channel and other parts of the BBC or other co-producers will be very helpful because we're now in the stage where, as you know, you can't really produce a drama without some form of co-production. So listening to your question, we're on it and the guy running it is very confident in it and he's presented to the Scotland Committee twice and we've seen the schedule develop. So I have great hopes for it, but we should not underestimate that we are launching a completely new channel into the ether and we shouldn't imagine that a mass audience will suddenly turn up to it. It will have to build and we'll have to give it time to build. We need to move on. I'm sorry, all Mr. The signs Morrison. That are good Mr. Morrison, we need to move on. Neil Finlay, please. Uh, thanks and feel free to call me whatever you like. I uh, <laughs> answer to many things occasionally, even in my name. Um, um, can I say uh, the new channel is going to broadcast, is it five hours a day, seven till 12? Yeah. Afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Um, according to the information we have, 50% of the shows will be repeats or archive programmes. How long will the nine o'clock news um, programmes run for? One hour. OK, so we have two and a half hours a day is going to be unique new programming because 50% is going to be repeats. An hour of that is going to be news bulletin, eh, the, the main news programme. And there's also going to be shorter news bulletins throughout the day, so maybe we could take another half hour of that. So we're paying £32 million for one hour of new production a day. In fact, happened, Neil, is that in the first phase of commissioning, 77% of the programmes will be new. This is not necessarily going to be the same rate that is going to be the rate throughout the year. We're, yeah. learn we're learning as we go. But over a piece. Yeah, what, what we've discovered... percent will be archived or repeated programmes. Yes. It, so I'm correct in my analysis that over the, over the longer term, it will be one hour of new production a day. No. Well, according to... If, it, if, if it's five hours a day, yeah. half of it's repeats. No, what I'm saying is that was the, the rule or the, the, the term that Ofcom laid down. Mm -hmm. What we found in the beginning through various means, is that we are commissioning more than 50% of originated hours. So it may turn out that we end up with more... I, I don't want to say what that number will be, because we don't know, but it may be that it is considerably more than 50%. We have to see how the money and the programmes and how everything beds down. According to the contract, then, or... or the that's the minimum, right. so, what you're describing. Yes, right. So let's go on the basis of that. also funds, funds the news hour, so you yeah, have yeah. to take the news hour out of that. Yeah. But there will be 900 hours of new content a year on that new service. According to what we have and the information we have, that will result, that will be one hour a day. If you took the archived and the repeated programmes and put them on your uh, online service, 
would that not free up more money for more original material? It's a, it's a question of how much c can you reasonably spend on this new channel. And don't forget, as I said at the beginning, we're the only country where we have two national channels. Nobody else in the BBC in any other part of the UK actually does this. So we're, we're exploring it as we go. There would be little point in taking the archive programmes. And we do actually have archive programmes on the iPlayer. But there'd be little point in taking all the um, archive programmes, some of which a lot of people want to see, off that channel if that meant that we couldn't afford to pay the programme tariffs for the original programme. And we ended up with a lot more quantity and a lot less quality. So when you launch a new channel, it is quite normal to have that kind of balance that you described. If you watch some of the smaller channels that are available in, in the digital sphere, you will notice that at nine o'clock, there is an hour of new original programming. And around those hours, those peak programs, there are other kinds of programs. Some might be acquisitions, some might be things you've seen before. This channel is actually better set up financially than virtually any digital channel in the rest of the UK. So therefore, the balance of original to acquired or archive will be monitored very closely. And as I say, at the moment, the original program rate is much higher than the 50%. OK. I mean, I think the issue ultimately comes down to the quality of what we're going to be watching and the lessons that learn from STV2, where, you know, at times nobody was watching any of the programmes because, frankly, they were repeats of repeats of repeats. I mean, we were, you know, what we don't want us is that we become Dave and that we're watching, you know, uh, the Dave channel where you watch Top Gear 24 hours a day if you're so minded. I mean, what we don't want to be watching is the singing kettle 24 hours a day. You will, from what I've seen of the schedule... Good though it is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And a lot of people watch it. But from what I've seen of the schedule, this will not be a repeat channel. This will be an originated channel. The question is how you use your £32 million wisely to get an audience and to show them original material alongside material that you know they already like. And we have an, opp an opportunity now to do things that we've never done before, like experiment and in the nether regions of the schedule. I think it's fair to say that we're, we're trying to target a younger audience, um, not with the earlier hours. So um, there will be a lot of new and innovative and possibly some risky stuff um, at that end of the schedule. Um, but I'm confident that it will be, it, it, it will offer um, something for everybody. <laughs> anyway, thank you. It does seem quite a gamble given that young people are watching less television um, and we want this to succeed. Can I just ask Mr Morrison, as I've said before, we've conducted a long-running inquiry into the screen sector in Scotland. I think it's fairly universal that everybody that we spoke to in the industry said there's not enough money uh, going into this channel. And I think that um, the, the questions from, from Neil Finlay and your, your responses sort of seem to suggest that. Now, we know uh, some of the programmes that are going to be made, there's going to be no high-end drama on the channel, and that's clearly for financial reasons. What have you done as your, in your position as representing Scotland on the board of the BBC? What have you done to argue for more money for that channel? Well, number one, um, we have argued with um, our executive and one of the most important members of that executive is sitting on my right, uh, that the channel should have a good launch and it should have adequate funds to have that launch, which I'm happy to say it has. Number two, so you, but I, I, excuse, all me, excuse me, let, let me finish, finish the point that, that you, you ask me funds. what I am doing. So number one, the, the, the network of the BBC, both financially and in collaboration on programmes, which will be, some of which will be co-commissioned by the channel and by the network, are being extremely supportive in helping us get programmes that otherwise the channel on its own could not afford. Now, I can't say exactly what those are because that hopefully will be a pleasant surprise to the viewer and they haven't yet been announced. But I can tell you there will be drama on this channel, which you said there wouldn't be. I didn't say there wouldn't be. I said high-end drama. There know, will there be high-end drama on this drama. channel. Yeah. 
What about, will it be original drama? It will be original and drama. And where will it fall in the tariffs, in terms of the tariffs for drama? It because will be much BBC more expensive have... than the normal tariff, and we will have to find partners. This is a very complex... Has it been commissioned? Sorry, I don't want to go into, too, I don't want to go into too much detail. What I'm saying is... I'm just asking we, yes we... or no, has it been commissioned? No, no, no just right. let me answer, just let me answer the thing. Right. We have persuaded our network colleagues to help us financially and help us with co-commissioning programmes to give this channel the best lift-off it possibly can. We are all the time persuading colleagues, both on the board and on the executive, to regard it as a priority to support this channel, which they are all doing. Yeah, but there isn't any more money. Uh, I'll move on to Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, Commissioner. That's no doubt why it's been delayed a few months. I think one of the things that uh, concerns the public is the kind of colossal salaries that uh, people in the BBC, uh, you know, for instance, from football pundits to Radio 2 presenters have been paid. And clearly one of the ways in which you're reducing the average uh, male salary and therefore the gender gap is by re uh, re uh, replacing you know, some people in the, like Chris Evans, for example, with females who are earning a lot less money. So it's just Zoe Ball. But if we go into the, the Ofcom report that was published on 25th of, of October, uh, the report concluded that viewers in Scotland watch 13% more BBC TV than, than the UK average, but uh, only 52% of people in Scotland have a favourable overall impression of the BBC compared to 64% of all UK adults. Uh, so I'm just wondering, why do you think there is this significant difference? And w how will, this, will the channel close that gap, this new channel? Can I divide that into two? Uh, the yep. fir your first question was talking about pay. Um, so can I ask Anne to comment on what's happening to our pay policy in the BBC? And then your second question was, how can we deal with the portrayal and representation which encourages more viewers to watch the BBC and to feel good about watching the BBC. Well, well the point is 13% more in, uh, people in Scotland are watching more BBC, but they've got a lower opinion of it. So, so how, how you try and uh, close that gap in Scotland? There's a combination of, of um, diagnoses around, around that. And um, in many ways, I do hope that the channel will go some way to address it. That is one of the main, uh, the underpinning reasons for creating it. Um, I also think uh, to have an hour-long news bulletin at the heart of the schedule for audiences in Scotland, I would hope will improve these general impression figures uh, that we're talking about. Um, it has long been a, ca a case that's been made by, by many people that a, that an hour-long news bulletin was wanted, was required. And I think there is something also about portrayal and representation and relevance um, among audiences in Scotland. It's a big country. We've got a sizable population and, um, and it's diverse. And I think we have an opportunity now to address that diversity, that ge geographic diversity, cultural diversity, in a way that we've not really hitherto had. And it is also about then working very closely with, with network colleagues to ensure that BBC One in Scotland and BBC Two in Scotland are as strong as they possibly can be. We can't replicate what they do with this new channel. But, um, and I think when we look at some of the, the drama that's been commissioned of late and some of the drama that's yet to appear in our screens, I think it is fair to say, and I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with the convener, um, that a returning drama would be fantastic. You could argue that Shetland is that, but what we would really want to see is something that was perhaps um, on a bit more, more frequently. Um, but when we do look at, at some of the stuff that has come through Scotland and some of it being produced by brilliant um, Indigenous companies, I think it is really heartening. And I think we have the, the wherewithal now to address some of that, that perception that exists there, um, as you rightly point out. We've just transmitted uh, The Cry, which was made by a Scottish company, Synchronicity, a co-production. We've got six uh, by 45 minutes of a drama called Clique, which is aimed at younger audiences. We've got Shetland Five coming up, as somebody said, and we've got a sixth series in development. Uh, we've got Trust Me, series two, which is again four by 60 minute dramas based in Scotland, shot in Scotland. And we've got another commission uh, recently announced called The Nest, which is again six hours. These will all make a difference I believe, just in terms of people feeling that they're seeing familiar um, surroundings, that they're, see, they're hearing um, accents uh, which reflect their reality. I think it's really important to have that critical mass, I suppose is what I'm trying to say, not just on the new channel, but on the other channels too. 
And in the recruitment um, of the journalists for the new nine, the, the new news hour, uh, they are going all over Scotland to position reporters uh, and other journalists in different parts of Scotland. So everybody is absolutely focused on what you just described, which is, is how do we make a channel that reflects modern Scotland and attracts viewers from all over Scotland because they see themselves or people like themselves on it. Convener, I know you're short of time. Would you like me to answer very briefly on, yeah, to, on top A? Um, uh, viewers and listeners, when we survey, expect us to have uh, top talent on BBC mm -hmm. programmes, and they understand that we have to pay market rates for some of those people. Um, what I think is um, helpful is we uh, employ 25 to 30,000 on air presenters over the course of the year. The top talent list that is published, people paid more than £150,000 from the licence fee represent 0.2% of those individuals, 1.4% of our overall spend, but the programmes that they present or appear on make up 40% of our overall viewing across radio and TV. So I think that sort of gives you a sense of the job that they do. And we have had a rigorous programme over recent years. It's spoken about in the annual report in the talent pay section of managing down um, the, uh, the overall talent bill and the proportion of our talent that, that are paid at that highest level by, by f bringing on more people, looking for more of a mix, uh, and indeed, in many cases, managing down the cost of talent over time. OK, and just, uh, Mr Morrison, you said at the beginning, you said that uh, in Wales there was a disproportionate amount of spend from the BBC. It's actually 92.3% uh, of what's raised in licence fee, but from your own figures, 350% of what is raised in licence fee is spent in London, 48.9% of the total. So do you agree that there should continue to be more programming made in other parts of the UK? And, for example, uh, is there any reason why Scotland can't become the same kind of drama hub that produces Doctor Who, Sherlock or whatever? Uh, you know, casualty that, that well, we have in Canada. Well, well, there is, uh, I think you might have noticed it, but it's going to gather pace. There is an out of London policy within the BBC. We are now commissioning more programmes from out of London, establishing uh, bases in different parts of the UK. Now, as it happened in Scotland, we established a factual base. So I think the next step for the Scottish industry, in my personal opinion, is to try and work out a way to build a sustainable scripted base. So as Donalda said, we have some very renowned drama companies in Scotland, but actually quite a small number. Therefore, in partnership with organisations like Creative Scotland and other partners, I think it is a task to try and build up the scripted base, the indigenous scripted company base in Scotland, which because of the size of the projects, would actually increase the size of the TV production industry quite dramatically, if you take my point. Scotland's share of BBC spend went from 10.3 to 9.1% over the last year, whereas London's only went from 49.4 to 48.9. So, so, I mean, quite clearly no, but, but we're still takes, in a... Having started such a policy, it, it literally takes years to establish a serious... Uh, amount of production out of out of London bases. So Salford took some years to build up. Cardiff took some years to build up. I think there is an opportunity. Now we see that Creative Scotland is changing its strategy from more of an arts council's strategy, independent independent talent strategy, towards a more creative industry <coughs> strategy. And more money has come in from the Scottish government. I think there is an opportunity, together with Creative Scotland, together with other partners, to build up our scripted base, which would genuinely allow Scotland to get more serious drama uh, contributions onto the screen. Now, as Donalda says, the number of drama series over the years has gone up, <clears throat> but I think there's quite a lot of mileage still to go. So I I'm tending to agree with you, but I don't think it will happen by tomorrow. I think it will take two or three years to build this up. But as I said right at the beginning, this year we're in, we'll see 76.7% .7 of the licence fees spent in Scotland. Next year, when the channel running throughout the year, we'll be nudging towards 80%. This is growing all the time. But in the end, the quota system is not the answer. The answer is 
attracting the right kind of talented companies to work in Scotland and to present ideas which the network commissioners really want so that we end up with more things on merit and not just by quota. Thank, thank you. 8.8% .8 of the licence fee you're spending in Scotland. And no one's calling for a quota. Yeah. That I know um, and, and I think you know, many people will be surprised that you know we have actually in this committee and predecessor committees been talking about lack of scripted drama uh, from Scotland for quite a long time and I think this committee has been very clear in its reports that the responsibility is with the commissioners notwithstanding the, the pressure we put on Creative Scotland but the commissioners are responsible for the decisions they make. Uh, Tavish Scott. Mr. Morrison, I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, just um, emphasise the point you made at the beginning about things like Blue Planet. I mean, I, I think the BBC should push their push what you're doing a little more in Scotland, because a lot of these questions you've heard today, I think, are just indicative of, uh, you know, of an, well, an inability to get your point across. And I think, um, frankly, all of you need to do a bit more of that about saying why do we, why, what the benefits of Blue Planet across Scotland. I mean, we, I would pay for the licence fee alone on that. If you didn't put Match the Day on in Shetland, there'd be outrage, you know, to, in our household, never mind anywhere else. So all the arguments you made at the start about spend and the importance of these UK productions right across the UK are really important. And I, you know, I think, I mean, occasionally I think you should do controller uh, live now and again and take viewers' questions. Meet the on. controller. Yeah, exactly. Eat the controller. You do that thing on the ch news channel where someone, a senior BBC executive, goes on and says, why did Farage appear on that package about this when 700,000 people were walking through, uh, through uh, London a few weeks ago? I mean, I may say I thought you were wrong about that. It doesn't matter. At least, at least a BBC executive had to answer that question. So I think you need to, if I may say, to push your own agenda so that maybe, maybe all these endless we'll questions about numbers are balanced by the fact that you produce all these programmes that we all want to watch. So yeah. that's my, I'm going to get that off my chest because I get fed up listening to this argument every time we... The, the question I actually wanted to ask was about uh, a documentary, about your point about impartiality. And Donaldo McKinnon's made the very, the very same point about impartiality. BBC Scotland produced a documentary called Dark Side of Dairy, which I don't know if you saw or not. Um, but um, three things about it that I think were wrong. Firstly, uh, it did not explain the rigorous inspection and transport which protect calves in transport. Secondly, the Scottish Government vets, inspect and monitor a system that wasn't explained on the documentary. And lastly, it used, it used footage of something that happens in another part of the world, but never said and, impl and instead implied that was going on in Scotland. That, for me, failed the test of impartiality as a documentary. And I wonder if you've had a look at that and BBC, would hold, BBC Scotland would hold up its hands and say, right, we didn't quite get that right. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to give that one to Donalda because she knows a great deal about this programme. <laughs> No, not at all. And I know we have had correspondence on, the, on this particular programme um, in which I have defended uh, quite robustly the journalism um, of the programme. Uh, you will probably know that a formal complaint has now been lodged with our executive complaints unit. And as that process um, is still ongoing, I would rather say nothing more about it until that they deliberate. Yeah, at some stage that will be published. And then if, the if, if that... If that uh, then if that uh, isn't satisfactory, um, there is an option then to take, yeah. take how many off. Yeah. How many formal complaints do, does the BBC get in a, the BBC Scotland get in an average year? Quite not that many, right? Uh, we all complain, yeah. but there's a difference between a formal complaint very and a morning, no, which you've heard few. this morning. Yeah. It's fair to say, yeah. Mr Scott, very okay. few. Thank you. Which again, says something about the robustness of our journalism. Quite. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll just wind up now. If I could just, before we do that, ask Donalda uh, to pick up on um, the points that were made about uh, high-end scripted uh, being com not yet commissioned for the new channel, but we're told it would be commissioned at some point in the new channel. Could you tell me what tariff rate that's going to have? Um, I can't, because it will have to, as you probably rightly identify, it will have to be... Um, a cocktail of funding in order to achieve it. There is uh, one commission that, uh, of which I know and there are ongoing discussions about it and I would absolutely uh, regard it as, as high end. Right. Um, so does that it's mean it's going to be between 650 and 1,000 uh, an hour? Around that. It will be, right. Yeah. Okay. And when will you be announcing that? It, we're not intending to have that for launch um, but uh, possibly for a uh, an autumn launch. Right. And, and finally, actually, to go back to Neil Finlay's point about original content, uh, you are putting an hour of news on at nine o'clock, um, and Mr Morrison actually made the point that m most channels put on um, commissioned new, new content uh, at nine o'clock. 
Is there any... Everyone I've spoken to in the industry says that that is a big mistake, that you will not attract viewers with news at nine o'clock at your peak time. Is there any uh, possibility of that decision being changed? No, we, we, we have actually undertaken some qualitative uh, uh, focus group research ourselves and there is a body of opinion out there that says they would value uh, a news hour at nine o'clock as an alternative to what's on elsewhere and particularly amongst um, a women and um, often uh, parents with, with, with young children um, who would value uh, their news at nine o'clock. And I think uh, it's true to say that we don't want to be competing directly with uh, dramas which are on offer elsewhere. People will have the opportunity, obviously, to consume these dramas uh, via catch-up or on-demand. Um, and, and we do think that, that unless it's... I mean, ob obviously, everything that, that, that we plan for this new channel has an element of risk to it. We don't know how, how it's going to work. Um, will we ever revise the decision? Well, we might have to. Uh, but at this stage, the, the intention is not to do so. Okay. And the look of the news, from what I've seen of it, will be quite different from a normal news bulletin. It will be more like a programme than a bulletin. Well, it's an hour, so it's hardly a bulletin. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. Mm -hmm. And we shall now go into private session. Thank you.